Okay, so, good. Uh, I'm not sure what happened either. Aside, we're back. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to roll with it. Um, and I'm not really sure where I left off, but I think the last thing I was saying is I've been in private practice in three different states, um, Maryland, Texas, and Georgia. Um, and about 80% of my clientele, honestly, um, in Texas and in Georgia have been um, military personnel. Um, but I think, you know, we're going to talk about all kinds of, there are different types of PTSD. Okay. So let's dive in. Um, First, PTSD are initials. Um, what is PTSD? What does that stand for? And tell us a little okay. bit about it. Okay, so PTSD um, stands for post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and specifically, when you think about PTSD, um, the important things for people to understand is that post is very important, that first word, um, because we all experience stress, right? Um, I think everyone has been traumatized in some kind of way because a trauma is some type of frightening um, or um, very excessively stressful situation let's say but but fear is a big part of it okay um and um one of the things that's important to make a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder is to realize that the post means that you've had to experience symptoms which we'll get into in a minute for 30 days or more um because we also have what's called acute stress disorder like you get frightened you see something maybe you've been in a car accident um you've been exposed to some type of traumatic or frightening experience um if you experience those symptoms for less than 30 days that's considered acute stress disorder versus um post-traumatic stress disorder so that's to be 30 days past the traumatic event okay Wow, that's new. I always learn something new whenever yeah, we're talking. Yeah, yes. Well, a lot of times when I talk about post-traumatic stress disorder, and I tell people that, you know, it's like, well, how many people 30 days after a stressful event have you experienced symptoms and everybody raised their hands? Like, yeah, just about everybody has experienced PTSD symptoms. Whether you have a diagnosis or not depends on the symptoms, the severity, the intensity. Okay, excellent. Um, so... We talked a little bit about this as far as trauma, but what are some of the causes of PTSD? Um, and then what are some of the effects of it? Okay. So some of the causes can be, you know, what we hear a lot about and what we probably see mostly on the news, right, um, are things like um, military events, um, you know, um, people being at war or having um, traumatic experiences um, uh, being deployed or, you um, things that are natural disasters, um, things like 9-11, um, um, you know, very public um, traumatic events that really can be traumatic for all of us. Um, lots of people even have PTSD from COVID. That's, you know, one of the most recent um, situations. Um, grief, um, can, grief and loss. Um, and one of the important things to remember is that uh, PTSD is an anxiety disorder. Um, so that's why I was saying it's very important to think about when you think about trauma, you think about fear, right? Because anxiety means fear. So we've all experienced anxiety at some point in time. It just depends on the symptoms, the other symptoms that accompany it and how they affect our, uh, our life. Um, and some of those signs and symptoms are things like um, flashbacks, um, if you kind of like relive the event um, over and over, um, things like um, nightmares, um, chronic nightmares, um, and, and intrusive thoughts or images, like you really can feel like you're there. Sometimes people can even disassociate kind of like from their reality or where they are and really feel like they're back um, in that traumatic, that, that place where that traumatic event occurred. Um, difficulty sleeping. Um, whether it is excessively sleeping or um, a lot of times people have difficulty, um, you know, falling or staying asleep. Um, sometimes you can have physical symptoms, night sweats, um, pain um, sometimes it, 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 in certain areas. Um, and just, just whatever it is, um, in order to have a diagnosis, it has to have some significant impairment on your um, social, occupational, educational, relational functioning. Um, okay. so, so sometimes you can, we can experience symptoms of something, but it's not necessarily a full diagnosis unless it's causing us some impairment. Okay. And so if someone is experiencing this type of impairment, if they believe that they have PTSD, is it treatable? Are there, are there ways to treat PTSD? It 
absolutely is treatable. And, and let me say this real quick, too, because I know you were talking about a little bit earlier about relationships and, and different types. So, you know, those are the symptoms I talked about. Let me talk about the different types, because that sometimes depends on the, that, that will indicate the treatment, right? That will dictate the treatment a little bit. Um, so there are different types. Um, you know, like I said, uh, a lot of times what we're exposed to the most is um, military type situations or what we hear about that. Um, but any type of, um, you know, something that's been significantly frightening, like say you have been, um, maybe you've been robbed, your house has been broken into. Um, we have, you know, what you all do, domestic violence, intimate partner violence, um, that can be very traumatic. Um, it is very traumatic, not can be, um, is very traumatic. And also there is relational trauma that doesn't always involve physical violence. Um, and I think that that is something that we're seeing a lot more of. It's always been around. Um, I think a lot of times people refer to it as psychological or emotional abuse. Um, but that can have a lot of, um, you know, trauma associated with it because that can build up anything that builds up. And that includes any relationship, um, not just interpersonal parent, child, um, workplace. We see a lot of that with workplace trauma. Sometimes, sometimes you have a hostile work environment um, and mm -hmm. that can cause um, PTSD. Um, and so that will really dictate the treatment. Um, it is very treatable, actually. You know, a lot of times when we see these drastic um, cases um, on, on the news and things, we, we kind of think it just pops out of nowhere. And, you know, I remember, you know, they used to talk about people going postal, right? Um, and then all of a sudden, this is what's going to happen. And, and really, it is most of the, it is very treatable. Um, and most of the time, um, people are functioning very high um, with it as long as they're getting treatment. Um, and treatment, first of all, you want to go to a um, mental health professional for sure. Because first of all, you need to have a valid diagnosis. Okay. Um, so not just Google, not just WebMD, um, because, you know, people love to do that. Um, that's one of the things I love about um you know, being a provider is it's hilarious how people come into me and they say, okay, I've got PTSD. And they'll go down, list the symptoms, and I know that they got them right off of the internet because I know, you know, kind of the order they go in. Don't do that. Okay. <laughs> um, but usually what is going to, the, the types of therapy, and usually you want to start at the least, um, not, not least restrictive, but um, the least intense therapy possible. It just depends on what your symptoms are. So a lot of times what we do is cognitive behavioral therapy, which is looking at the links between your thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Um, and, and basically be, being able to, if, if I could, if I could um, kind of simplify it as sort of taking your thoughts um, and feelings captive by allowing your, instead of allowing them to dictate your behavior, um, you allow your behavior to dictate them, and then, you know, you start to have a little bit more positive thoughts, less intrusive, and that will produce better feelings. So you kind of just reverse that order. Usually it goes the other way. Um, and, and under that also, or in addition to that, we have cognitive processing therapy where you actually are just processing your thoughts um, and then kind of learning how to do things with that. Um, you have a little bit more extreme therapies like prolonged exposure, exposure therapy, I'm sorry, where um, you kind of, we used to call it telling your story. So you kind of write out the event um, kind of over and over again, and you go over it with your therapist and you kind of, it's like reliving it. It is, and people are not a fan of it. They hate it. I tell people that right from the beginning, you're going to hate this, but it is effective. Um, where basically you're kind of taking control of the situation. Um, you're controlling your symptoms that you're experiencing during the time. You're figuring out what works best for you. It does depend on the trauma, though. It is really up to the mental health professional to figure out what is the safest and most effective type of treatment. Um, and then we also have things like um, EMDR. Um, and not sure if um, that's something you've heard of before, but that is um, eye movement desensitization. Uh, Desensitization. I'm so sorry. Blah, 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 blah. Desensitization. A lot of, um, a lot of, a lot of, of additives and, I mean, um, I consonants and vowels in there. I don't speak a lot of clinic and ease. I try to keep it simple. <laughs> um, and, and reprocessing. So basically what it's doing is tracking your eye movement, how things, your brain is kind of responding to 
the stress. So again, you're still kind of being exposed to it by talking about it um, and learning how to kind of reprocess that. Um, and, and again, kind of take control over that. That's not something I specialize in, but I do, I have with some of my very difficult cases. Um, if prolonged exposure doesn't work, CBT, CBT doesn't work, um, then sometimes I will refer to somebody for um, EMDR. Okay. And then when you say mental health professional, can you give me an idea of some of those professions who are able to um, diagnose? Because I know there's a span of help that you can get um, in the mental health field. Some people are qualified to make a diagnosis and some are not. Can you give us like a, a short list of some of the professionals that are qualified to give a diagnosis? Absolutely. So so any of your MDs, right, medical doctors um, or DO, doctor of, um, they're licensed and able to diagnose. And then, and that includes, you know, family practitioners, pediatricians, psychiatrists, you know, if we were talking about mental health. And most of the time, even though you're family doctors and things, they may put a diagnosis in there, but they're usually going to refer you to if they feel like that's what you're, you're dealing with. Um, and then next, um, under that, you'll have your clinical psychologists, which are your PhDs, right? Um, and sometimes PsyDs, um, which is doctor of psychology. Um, but both of them are able to um, diagnose. Licensed clinical social workers, such as myself, LCSWs are able to. Um, now, what I am and many of the mental health professionals are, are master's level um, mental health professionals. Um, the difference is you have to have a license. Whatever the highest licensure is in that state for you to practice independently, you have to have that to diagnose. So that would be LCSWs, licensed clinical social workers, LPCs, which are licensed professional counselors. Um, now, remember, in each state, sometimes these are called something different. Um, I'm an LCSW here, and I was in Texas, but in Maryland, I was a licensed certified social worker dash clinical, but it's still that highest level of, you know, whatever your licensure is, and that's governed by the state and the board. Um, so we said LPCs, um, and sometimes that'll be LCPC. It, again, depends on the state. Um, uh, nurse practitioners, um, they're able to, some nurse practitioners, especially if they're, you know, most of them are prescribers, um, so they're able to diagnose and prescribe. Um, LMFT, licensed marriage and family therapists, um, they are as well. Um, I'm not sure of any of the other ones, because sometimes you will have just kind of general degrees that are mental health professional, or it just depends on the school mm -hmm. that you went to. But whatever that state licensure board is, um, they would have to be able to um, grant you that highest level of licensure, which means you can diagnose and also receive reimbursement from insurance companies. Whether you're in private practice or you deal with an agency or whatever, that's the level that you're at, that you would be able to yeah. So basically, we want to look for a license. Absolutely. From, from always, a always look from a license, for a license from a board. That's exactly right. Okay. And if you're seeking help through your insurance companies, um, if they've got people on your list, they can diagnose because insurance companies only have people there that they're going to reimburse. And they're only going to reimburse people who have a license and who are at that highest credentialed level in their state. That's good. That's good information. Okay, so if someone has experienced a trauma, um, they feel like they've had these symptoms for a prolonged amount of time, they have, they are starting to be impacted in their social life, in their work life, in their physical health. Um, what, what are some next steps they can take to seek help? Um, um, well, I would definitely, um, you know, just like we talked about, look at your insurance company, see what local providers are there. Um, all When you look at those lists as well, go ahead and Google them. Um, it took me forever to know that people just, you know, could Google you, but, you know, I learned that maybe about 12 years ago when a lot of my clients were coming on, how are you referred? Oh, I Googled you and I like what it said on your profile. Um, so most of the time you're going to find those professionals have some type of, bi you know, biographical information somewhere, profile information that you can read and just see if that's going to be a good match and a good fit for you. Um, also, start with your medical your medical professional. That's the first thing anyway. Always rule out medical. When you are experiencing any type of medical and when or mental health condition, I always, to me, everything's health. 
health is health, right? Um, all of, you know, when, when I, th I think about from head to toe. Um, so even if something is going on mentally, that still is a part of your body. Right. And that's still your physical health. So, uh, you know, start with your medical professional, especially if you have a primary care doctor, which I recommend everyone has, because build a rapport and trust with them. So that way you can talk with them. A lot of times they have colleagues and things that they trust that they refer to. And that way you kind of have that basis because by name referrals are the best. Um, usually when people send people to me and they say, oh, my friend or my son, you know, somebody new of you went to you or somebody else went, they are already coming in kind of trusting and, you know, because somebody they trusted, um, you know, what, what, you know, had a positive experience. Um, so go with what you know first. Um, the other thing I would say is don't wait until it's prolonged. It doesn't matter if it's acute stress or if it's put, you know, maybe we can help and it, it doesn't have to get the post, you know? Um, so I would say as soon as you start experiencing anything that's impacting your life, um, talk to somebody get some counseling. Um, if it's grief counseling, a lot of your hospices, it does not matter what it, you didn't have to have a family member who passed away. You didn't have to have a family member who passed away, um, who got care from that hospice. A lot of the hospices sometimes have either grief support groups or um, they have grief counselors there that will do counseling some for free. So sometimes you would check with your hospices, check with the local hospitals. Um, support groups are great. Um, you know, over whatever it is that you're experiencing. So if you can look, you know, Google those and look for support groups, that's always great. It's good to know you're not alone. Yes. Yes, that's important. And that leads me to my final question. Um, if we know someone who um, has been diagnosed with PTSD and they know it, or we suspect based on what we're learning, um, that they may be um, struggling with PTSD, what's the best way for us to support them? Um, check in on them. <laughs> you know, do frequent checks. You know, isolation for any type of mental health disorder is not good. It's not good for us as people anyway. We are meant to be connected, even people who are introverts. Um, all introvert means is that you derive energy you get energized by having your alone time that doesn't mean you should be alone all the time and especially when we're experiencing things that can be one of the most dangerous times to be alone and to be isolated so let's check on people if you see things that are not in the norm for folks ask questions um get up in people's business you know a lot of us feel like you know in this day and time you know we don't want to we don't want to ask people stuff. You know, we kind of come in. If we've got garages, you know, the garage door goes up. We ride in, it goes down. People don't know their neighbors anymore. You know, it's like get to know people and get to know kind of their habits. We don't have to stalk them. You know, everybody's busy. They've got stuff to do. But just let them know that you care. Empathy, compassion, care. Um, someone reaching out. Even now, it's like you could text somebody. Hey, just thinking about you. Just checking on you. How are things going? Especially if you know they've already experienced. How are you doing with X, Y, and Z? You know, That's so you know, good. Let, let's ask. You know, let let's check on people. That's, people like to so know good. that you care about them. Absolutely, one hundred percent. Um. Okay. So we're getting close to our our 30 minutes i like to keep these 30 minutes or less um do you have any final thoughts or anything that you want to share with um those who may be watching live or those who will watch the replay um about ptsd or trauma or anything that you that's on your heart to share yes what i will say is there's a couple things and i'm, I'm kind of still in this i got this from a pastor um not that long ago but one of the things that he said was um, trauma that is not transformed, which means changed, right, um, is transferred. And that is so true. And that really resonated with me because I've seen that a lot and even have experienced it personally and in my professional experience, okay? So what I would say, what I get out of that is let's take care of ourselves and let's take care of each other, um, kind of like what we were just talking about. Because if not, whatever you're experiencing, you're going to pass that along to somebody, whether it's at work, whether it's your loved ones, whether it's a spouse or in a re interpersonal relationship, whether it's a parent, whether it's your children. Um, you're going to pass that on to somebody else, and then they're going to have to deal with it in their own way. Um, and they were not the cause of your trauma, right? And so we all have a responsibility to take care of ourselves first. Um, kind of like on the airplane where it says, listen, 
they give you that warning, put on your oxygen mask before you try to help other people. Mm -hmm. So if we've got things going on that we need to take care of, um, if we have childhood trauma, if we were neglected in any way, if we were mistreated, and we all were in some type of way, shape or form, take care of that before you try to take care of others. Because if not, you will transfer your trauma. And now we've got secondary trauma, right? We've got um, double the trauma. Um, and then sometimes people may not experience it personally directly, but then secondary trauma is when you, you know, you kind of witness or deal with the experience of others because they've been traumatized. So all we're doing is sharing trauma. We don't want to share that. It's good to share, but not trauma. Um, right. So we have to be careful about that. So basically that that's the thing I would say is let's just be kind to one another. Let's be kind to ourselves and let's take care of ourselves, put our health and our mental health, um, you know, as a priority. And if we can do that, then we will be able to, you know, share and care with other people and take care of other people the way that we were intended. Very, very good. Thank you so much. Absolutely. It's always a yes, pleasure to speak with you. Lakeisha Brooks, <laughs> licensed clinical social worker, so um, and my very best <laughs> friend. Um, I do love when we get to have these conversations where we get to speak professionally because we have a lot of girl talk yes. um, over over cheese puffs. Yes. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it's good to, yes. to talk shop yes. um, every now and then. But thank you for joining us for this Talk Tuesday. Um, I know you've encouraged a lot of people and educated them and helped them a lot. So um, we always appreciate when you come and speak to us. So thank, thank you, you so much. Me. I appreciate it. Have a fantastic right, day. Be blessed. Bye. All right. Bye. -bye.